Because at the end of the day, who makes the payments, right? It, a lot of times it's the tenants that make the payments, not the actual person that owns the house, right? So that's kind of the idea behind even DSCR loans is um, the owner isn't, they're not technically making the monthly mortgage payments. It'll be the tenants that are actually paying rent to the landlord to make the mortgage payments. Take this for example, you know, a lot of cities have laws against short-term rentals and Airbnbs, but in my opinion, this is not a short-term rental. This is not an Airbnb. My guess is on a lot of these properties we buy, people are gonna complain. That's just the nature of short-term rentals. And we're gonna have to legally fight this battle to prove that, no, this is totally different. This is a whole new industry that does not exist. Well, that's think about city. it too, like all the things, like, okay, the city makes taxes, that's great, right? It attracts more people to the city, right? Because there's more places to stay. Um, people can now afford to go travel as a family. Mm -hmm. Dude, if you try to travel a family of, you know, six, getting three hotels is super expensive. Oh, yeah. One Airbnb is the same price. Right. Let's jump into the three different things that I look for when picking an Airbnb market. So the very first thing you're gonna look at when picking an Airbnb market is the location. Now, obviously that's common sense, but let me explain. When I think about location, there are a few different things I'll ask myself. Number one, would I want a vacation there? As I mentioned earlier, I love to vacation in Big Bear, so it's a location that makes sense for me. Maybe I'm thinking about getting an Airbnb in Reno, but I'm not gonna get the use out of it vacation-wise. I never want a vacation up there, so it would strictly be a business decision to own an Airbnb. I wouldn't get any use out of it like I would in a place where I want a vacation. So I think that's a really important question you gotta ask yourself with location. The second part about location is the management. So I'll tell you, with Big Bear, that part actually sucks. If you're getting charged 30% for management, you will not cash flow any money. In fact, you'll probably be in the negative. And I've heard of other cities charging similar rates, but I've also heard of other cities charging way less, like 10%. So look at what the management companies are charging in that location. But if you plan to do self-management, which is what I do, you're gonna have to look at what you have as resources in that city. And resource-wise, I'm talking about the cleaners and the handymen. Those are the two biggest things that are gonna determine whether your Airbnb succeeds or not. Can you trust your cleaners to be there on time every single day and make sure that it's ready for the next guest? Can you get a handyman out there ASAP if something breaks for a guest and they need it fixed right now? And I'll be honest with you, in Big Bear, this is not a plus. The workforce is very small, and so there's not a lot of cleaners. There's not a lot of handymen. It's a lot easier in a big city where you have a bigger job pool. Now, that doesn't mean you can't self-manage and do it. I do it in Big Bear just fine, but it can be tough, and you gotta take that into consideration when picking your location. And I should also add, when I say self-manage, I'm not the one actually managing my Airbnb. I did do that early on when we first started. Once I learned the ropes, I ended up hiring someone else here in Vegas to manage it for me. And I pay her 10%, so it's a lot less than the 30% Big Bear companies would charge me. And so those are the two things I want you to think about when you're picking a location. How difficult is it gonna be to manage? What's the workforce look like? And do you want a vacation there? So the second thing you're gonna look at is the ROI. So we always have to get a good return on investment if we're gonna invest. And so we need to look at how much our property's selling for. How much are they renting for on Airbnb? And if we can't rent them on Airbnb, how much are they renting for long-term in a normal rental? And this is simply gonna be your own calculations. You need to first look at how much does a property cost in this area? Let's say I'm interested in the houses that are $300,000. I'm then gonna look at how much does that house rent for long-term if Airbnb doesn't work out. Every market's gonna be different, so you need to look at that calculation. When it comes to renting it on Airbnb, figuring out that is gonna be much more difficult. And there are really two main ways to do it. The first is by just going to Airbnb and seeing how much things cost. You're gonna look at the area you're looking at buying in. You're gonna make sure that it's the same bedrooms, the same bathrooms. If you're gonna renovate it, make sure you're looking at properties that are renovated. Make sure that they're the same quality as what you expect to have. My properties are fully renovated. They rent nice. And so they get top dollar. But if you're going to have this kind of in-between property that's not super nice, don't expect to get top dollar in the same as the other renovated ones. It's the same way that we flip houses. You got to really make sure that you're comping correctly. So looking at Airbnb is a great resource. If you can, you can also try and contact other hosts in your area. So you can go on Facebook groups for Airbnb in those cities. You can also contact the host directly on Airbnb, see if they'll let you pick their brain and really just try and figure out how much can I expect to rent these for over a year? What kind of seasons does it have? In Big Bear, we have the winter is the very high point, the fall's kind of slow, 
summers are good, spring's a little slow again, but overall we're gonna get a blend of how much it's gonna get every single year. And finding out this information isn't that hard. You could do it just from Airbnb, you can do it just from Facebook groups. But if you wanna pay a little bit of money, there's also a website called AirDNA. AirDNA will give you all of the data in a market. They'll tell you exactly how much things are renting for, they'll give you the occupancy levels and a whole bunch of other data points. Now, I don't know the exact price of AirDNA, but it's not that expensive. But what I'll say is either way, whether you use AirDNA or not, you wanna definitely talk to other hosts in the area and get an idea of things you need to know. And once you have that, you can figure out your ROI. Just using rough numbers, if you know that you can buy this house for $300,000 and it's gonna get 60,000 a year in rent, that is a 20% return gross revenue. Now, obviously, if you wanna get complex with it, you wanna take your net profit because we're just talking gross here, but also too, depending on how you buy the property, your cash on cash return might be super big. Think about it, if you put 10% down on the house, you're into the deal for $30,000. What if your net profit was $30,000 as well? Well, now you got 100% cash on cash return. So you can look at your ROI a number of ways and figure out whether it makes sense or not. And this leads me to my third point about picking a market, and that is the state legislation or the city legislation. Are they short-term rental friendly? Well, I've talked about it in Vegas. We are not here. The hotels want you staying on the strip. They do not want you out and about away from where all the activity is happening. And so they make it extremely difficult to do Airbnbs. In fact, it's illegal in most places. Now the city of Henderson is allowing Airbnbs because they're not on the strip. They don't care. They wanna bring more revenue to Henderson. So even though the main market like Las Vegas might not be Airbnb friendly, there might be a county or a city right by it that is. Also before you buy, I would look into whether or not they're talking about changing the rules. Maybe there's a bill that they're trying to get passed that's gonna extremely limit some things. Maybe there's a bill that's gonna open it up. I don't know. Just make sure you're checking what kind of legislation is being proposed. The last thing I'll add to the legislation is, does their economy depend on it or not? As I said, Vegas wants you on the strip. Their economy depends on you staying at casinos and gambling. Big Bear's economy actually depends on Airbnb. They do not have enough hotels for all the people that visit Big Bear. And so Airbnb is a way for them to get way more tourism than they otherwise would have. So I don't ever see them outlawing Airbnb because it would destroy their economy. Now that doesn't mean that they aren't gonna regulate it. They definitely regulate it in a way that I don't like, but I gotta do it and it is what it is. But there's almost zero chance that they ever eliminate Airbnb. So think about that with other markets. How is Airbnb affecting their economy? And those are pretty much the three things I look for when picking an Airbnb market. You can do this all across the country and figure out, does this fit or not? Now, are you gonna find the perfect market that fits everything? They're legislation friendly, the ROI is great, you want a vacation there. You might not, but definitely pick which ones are most important to you. If it's strictly just a business deal for you and you wanna make a great ROI, you're open to almost anywhere. But if you're really passionate about vacationing there and making it a second home, then you gotta pick somewhere that you really enjoy. Maybe the ROI is not as good as somewhere else, but you're gonna gain emotional value by having one there. Welcome to the first ever Airbnb for my Tykes NFT holders. So if this house looks familiar, it's because I've done a YouTube video on it before showing what it was like before we renovated it. And I talked about all the different avenues we could take. Initially, I was thinking we might just rent it out as a normal rental. I also thought about airbnb it because it's in an area that allows Airbnbs and it would make a lot of money doing it that way. And I also thought about making it a corporate rental where I would rent it for over 30 days, it's fully furnished, and it would make a lot of money that way. But as we went along, I realized that this would be the perfect property to do something that has never been done before by real estate investors or NFTs. So I'm gonna walk through this house and show you a little bit about what we did as well as the guest house that is attached to it and explain what's going to happen and how Tykes NFT holders are gonna benefit tremendously from this house as well as many others across the country. So to give you some backstory on this home, I bought it for a million dollars last year with the intention to flip it. But as I walked it, I realized that this thing would be a great rental property because it's a nice big home, it's in a short-term rental area, and it has a very big guest house that when you combine it all together, it would cash flow a lot, no matter if you did a long-term rental or you did an Airbnb or a corporate rental. 
Along with being a great rental, we got it at a great price. I just recently refinanced this house at a $1.5 million valuation. So we were able to use the Burr strategy and pull out all of the cash in this deal. And so now it's just a matter of what do I wanna do with it? If you've been following me on Twitter and on Instagram and everything else, you've probably seen me talking a lot about my NFT project called Tykes. And with Tykes, we're gonna be doing so many things in the digital real estate space. And the way that I define digital real estate is simply anything and everything to do with real estate and crypto. So whether it's NFTing real world properties, whether it's NFTing a fund syndication, or even if it's just metaverse land. Moral of the story is digital real estate is gonna be a multi-trillion dollar industry and I want Tykes to be at the forefront of that, pioneering the way. Now, some of you guys watching may have no idea what Tykes is, so I'll give you the one minute version of it. It is an NFT project that I am launching, hopefully in early July. And the goal is to gather up together as many people as possible who are focused on digital real estate and all the things I just talked about. I've been a part of masterminds for many, many years. They've served me very well. And if I can get everyone who's passionate about digital real estate to buy a Tyke and join the community, we're gonna be able to do a ton of stuff together with starting businesses, getting investors, collabing on different things, getting developers, influencers, everything that is gonna push this industry forward. And they're gonna to have to join Tykes to do it because that's gonna be the premier place for anyone who's interested in digital real estate. So that is my first and foremost goal with Tykes. But I understand with NFTs, you gotta have hype, you gotta have other utility and other perks. And so from day one, actually before even day one, because this is already here. But on day one, my Tykes holders are gonna be able to get access to this home right here, as well as the guest house. And I can tell you, no NFT project has done anything like this before. If you look at most of them, they all say, yeah, we're gonna do something after you give us money for the mint. Well, I'm already putting my money where my mouth is before we've ever even minted a Tyke. We've done a ton of stuff behind the scenes that you guys have no idea about where I'm investing quite a bit of dough to make sure that Tykes have the best utility and perks along with the strongest community out there for digital real estate. And in fact, probably more perks than any other NFT that is out there, period. I don't care if you're talking about bored apes or if you're talking about moonbirds or anything else, we're coming with more utility day one than any other project in history. And this is why I want people like you who are watching this video to be in our community. Even if you have no idea about crypto or NFTs and you're just into real estate, you need to know about this stuff because it is going to be huge here in the near future. And so if you could be at the forefront and be a pioneer with us at Tykes, you're gonna be so far ahead of everyone else and you're gonna get a huge advantage and you're gonna get in early on a lot of things that are gonna change the world. So let me explain how Tyke NFT holders are gonna get access to stay at this house. We are gonna try a brand new concept that is kind of similar to a timeshare. It's kind of similar to an Airbnb. Quite frankly, it's never been done before. And so it's gonna be interesting to see how the regulations play a part of it because we're kind of just setting new standards and I'm sure they're gonna make new laws based on what we do at this house. So here's how it's gonna work. If you get one of our Tyke NFTs, you're gonna be able to stake that NFT, meaning that you can lock it up and then you're gonna start getting yield. So what kind of yield are you gonna get? Well, we're gonna reward you with a cryptocurrency we're developing for Tyke holders. In order to make that cryptocurrency valuable and have use case, you've gotta find ways to use it. Well, one of the ways we're gonna use it is with real estate just like this. You're gonna be able to buy the rights to stay at this house for certain nights. Now, it's kind of like a timeshare, like I said, but not really, because you don't own the house or anything like that. You're just simply buying the rights to stay here. And the way that we're gonna do it is by taking 300 days out of the year and turning that into 100 different NFTs. So maybe there's an NFT from January 3rd to January 5th. Maybe there's one from July 7th to July 9th. The point is you'll be able to buy the NFT for those dates and it will give you the ability to stay at this house on those dates for as many years as we set for that NFT. So we might say you have the rights to stay here for two years on those dates. It might be three years. We haven't quite decided on the final number yet. So that's why I say it's somewhat like a timeshare because you're gonna have the rights to stay here on those dates. 
Now, in order to stay here, you've got to not only buy the NFT for those dates, but you've also got to have a tyke. You know, we're not letting anyone just stay here. We only want our NFT holders to be able to use things like this beautiful bathroom. And this house is just going to be the first of many. My vision is to buy sick real estate all over the country. I want to buy houses in Lake Tahoe, in Miami, in some of the best places where our tyke holders are going to get to pick and let us choose where we want to go. It's going to be something that's never been done before. And uh, that's just one of the perks that you can use the cryptocurrency for. There's going to be other real life events. There's going to be other things that we reveal along the way. But my point is from day one, you're going to have real world value when you buy a tyke. And this is just the beginning. Now, one of the reasons I chose this house for the very first one is because, you know, I already owned it so we could do it really quickly, but also it's here in Vegas. I would love to meet some of my tyke holders who end up staying here. And along with that, it has an enormous yard and also this guest house, which I talked about. So we're going to end up making it so that whoever is staying here will always be a tyke holder. And you're going to be able to network with the person who's staying at the guest house for those certain dates. We're actually going to break this off into two different NFT sets. So somebody will be able to buy the dates here for this house. Another person will be able to buy the dates here for that house. And if you want to combine them, then you got to make sure that you buy the dates for both houses so you can have the whole thing to yourself. Now, obviously the house is not completely done yet. You can see we didn't have linens or TVs and we're going to add some other cool stuff out here that you know, is going to be very much web three crypto theme that I think you guys will really enjoy. But as you can see, we're really close to being ready to do things that no one's ever done on day one launch. Now, side note beyond tykes, um, for those of you who saw the first video of this house, this guest house we're in was actually more like a workshop. There wasn't any kitchen, there wasn't any bedrooms or anything. We actually converted this into a full on house. It is a three bedroom, two bathroom home now. And as you can see, we got the kitchen over here. You've got everything you need. We've got the master bedroom right here. And you know, it's a good size bedroom. It's got its own bathroom. I mean, you got that pool view right there and it has its own separate entrance from the other side of the street as well. So this house just made so much sense for doing our first ever project with tykes. Um, you've got this other bedroom. It turned out really nice, especially considering that this place was just a blank canvas. I really like what our team did with it as far as laying it out. They actually went against my advice and did a totally different floor plan. And I'm glad they did because in my original vision, I was only going to do a two bedroom home. And so now they made it a three bedroom and it's just, it looks really good. And the reason I'm showing you this is because you need to understand when you're buying NFTs, the people behind it are going to be the ones that determine whether it succeeds or not. There are so many things that have to happen operationally. And quite frankly, almost 99% of these NFT projects you see are led by people who have never had business success or operational success, or they're not even doxxed, meaning you don't know who they are. They're operating under an alias. I can tell you when you buy tykes, you're getting somebody who's fixed and flipped over 500 homes who owns almost 500 rental units who has multiple businesses. And I don't say that to like make myself, you know, seem cool. I say it because I know how to run a business and make sure that we can deliver on value. And so to take on a big undertaking like this, where we are going to buy real estate all over the country in the coolest places, get them fixed up, get them furnished, get them in this ecosystem of NFTs for our tyke holders. It's going to take a lot of work, but I know that it's something we're fully capable of doing because we're gonna prove it day one. Now, another big part of being an operator in this digital real estate space is the legal framework because so many of the things that we're about to do are kind of gray area legally. Take this for example, you know, a lot of cities have laws against short-term rentals and Airbnbs, but in my opinion, this is not a short-term rental. This is not an Airbnb. Nobody's paying me to stay here right? You guys would have the rights to stay here. You're not giving me cash. It's not listed on Airbnb. So, you know, my guess is on a lot of these properties we buy, people are going to complain. That's just the nature of short-term rentals. And we're going to have to legally fight this battle to prove that, no, this is totally different. This is a whole new industry that does not exist because the truth is I'm not getting paid for you to stay here. I'm actually losing money by letting people stay here. When you buy this NFT to have the rights to stay at these dates, we're going to burn those tokens. We're going to burn that cryptocurrency. So it doesn't ever go in my pocket. It's just a way to control the inflation and the tokenomics 
of the coin. And so I have a whole legal team working on the specifics of all these things we wanna do, not only with these quote unquote timeshare Airbnbs that we buy all over the country, but also with many of the other things we're gonna do in the digital real estate space that I'll be talking about here later. And I can tell you my approach with Tykes and everything that we do to pioneer this digital real estate space is that I'm gonna take action and ask for forgiveness later. We're gonna figure out what happens when we do these things and we're gonna adapt and pivot and make sure that we can push this space forward together. And like I said, this is just the beginning of what we're gonna do in digital real estate. I plan to dedicate the majority of my time towards building up this industry, pioneering and leading the way, building businesses that are gonna transform the world, and I need your help to do it. So if you're in real estate, if you're in crypto, if you're an investor, if you're a developer, if you're an influencer, I want you to join the Tykes community. So if you wanna do that, all you gotta do is go to tykes.io, support the community, engage, be with us, help us grow, and um, get ready for that launch date for the Mint because it is going to be an enormous project. I really believe it's gonna be a blue chip and uh, I'm really excited for it. So go check out tykes.io and uh, you might be staying here in the very near future. Nobody can really Airbnb anymore because you gotta be, you can't be within a thousand square right, feet of right. someone. And it's just like, they've already got all their licenses. Like every, like the whole area, yeah. if you actually look at it, is pretty tapped out. I know, you look at those green circles and yeah. try to find one that's set apart. That's why I think for those that want to do it, once the floodgates open in Vegas, you're yeah. going to have to be on it right yeah, away. It's going to be yeah. floodgates. It's going to be yeah. just first come, first serve, and it's going to be a battle to get to that desk. And then once it's built up, once the setbacks are, or there's no space. Right. There can be no more. Yeah. I just think, like, let it be a free-for-all. Like, at the end of the day, um, I would definitely say the HOAs have control. Like, mm -hmm. hey, if your HOA doesn't let you Airbnb, tough Can't luck. Do. Right. Right? But if you are not, if you don't have an HOA, let people – like, that's why they don't have an HOA. So they can do whatever they want, right? And I think, uh, you know, for instance, I have two or three in Henderson that I bought. And I was like, oh, man, these would be tight Airbnbs. Like, let's see. And I look. I'm like – there's one that's 900 feet away. I'm like, dude. It's that close. Yeah, I'm like, we can't. What's the exceptions here? I know. You know? And there's none. Yeah, there's none. I'm like, it's, uh... literally, there's no <laughs> how. There's not. It's one guy. So dumb, dude. The whole so what are you going to do with it? Um, I don't know yet. I think uh, I did a YouTube video on it. I uh, It's just now done. I might freaking, who knows? Maybe I'll flip it. Um, yeah. But my plan was to initially just rent it out long term or furnish it like you guys are doing do a 30 day rental and just you know be done with it like let i don't know appreciate yeah just let it do its thing yeah. but um i i lean towards keeping it just for um the taxes mm -hmm. but uh i just think the whole thing's dumb i'm just like <laughs> i've already experienced it with big bear too like at the end of the day people complain about um, there being no inventory. It's like, there's no inventory anywhere. Like, it sucks for everybody. Yeah. You think it's just like, you're the only one with this problem. Um, investors have a tough time getting houses we now. All do. Yeah, like, you ain't the only one with this problem. Uh, then they're like, oh, the hedge funds are buying all these up. Well, yeah, you complain that there's no rentals for rent, right? Who's going to buy the houses to put them up for rent? Somebody's got to do it, right. right? So the hedge funds do it. Then uh, people complain about the hotels and this stuff. I'm like, yeah. well, yeah, because freaking you don't let Airbnb. You know, it's just like, everyone complains about something. I'm like, let it all be a free all right, for all. Let it happen. Yeah. But the hotel's got to make some money off. You know, the city's got to make money. The hotel's got to make money. I'm so fine I think with that. That's where it's going. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, tax it. That's yeah, fine. Figure yeah. out a dollar and right. tack it on and let, let us go. Right. Let us do it. Yeah. Why well, does it matter if there's one next door to each other? It's, you know, more that's tax better. for the city. Yeah. It's better for the city. It's, it's better, better for, for the, the city and it's better for, you know, those two people. It's like, oh, right. Cool. You know, both of them are doing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think, I don't know. Hopefully, I think they'll, They'll finally adjust as time goes on because one thing I always do is I study history about how all these things played out. And that's why like my feelings about the metaverse are what they are. Just just thinking historically how this has happened. Um, but I was watching or I was reading the book about um, Uber and how they got started. And basically what Uber did was super um, cutthroat. They were just like, we're going into every city. I don't care if they say it's legal or not. We're just doing it. And so they would go into each city and then they would be like dodging the city officials mm -hmm. and all this stuff. And like literally they just blanketed the whole city with 
Uber drivers and incentives to get them to sign up so that there were so many drivers that the city couldn't do anything about yeah, it. They got too yeah, big. They, they, got, down. Yeah. they got too big, and the taxis tried to fight them. Everyone tried to fight them. But at that point, they grew too large, yeah. and there was nothing anyone could do about it. And then, look, you've got Uber everywhere. Yeah. Like, you know, you've got Lyft. It's a great thing for society. You know, the fact that I can just go on my phone and have a car here in five minutes is amazing. It is. Right, and if you don't want to go stay at a hotel with – a pandem- global pandemic going on and be around a bunch of people and you want to yeah. stay in a single home with your family, I mean, it's not a bad, you know, it's well, not a bad thing to have. Well, think about city. it too. Like all the things, like, okay, the city makes taxes. That's great, right? It attracts more people to the city, right? Because there's more places to stay. Um, people can now afford to go travel as a family. Mm-hmm. Dude, if you try to travel a family of, you know, six, getting three hotels is super expensive. Oh, yeah. One Airbnb is the same price. All right. Right. So somebody who might not have come to Vegas is now coming Mm -hmm. because of the affordable cost. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, another one is just like the people buying the houses now have some strategy. Like the reason I haven't kept rentals in Vegas, because they just don't pencil out. Right. Like on long term rent, you might break even or maybe even lose money based on just where rents are compared to what we have to buy them for. And it's like if I could keep more rentals, I totally would. If you gave me another option to like monetize sure, it sure. and uh you know what does that do it makes people buy more houses here in vegas it makes prices more go up it makes more money yeah. like gets things going i agree so i don't know dude i it annoys me just thinking about the political side of things i'm becoming Hopefully old. a year from now we'll sit down yeah. and talk again about how easy it is now yeah, yeah, yeah it's right. all rolled out and it's yeah. all good you got a hundred airbnbs <laughs> yeah. it's crazy though because you see like you see hundreds of them on airbnb here in vegas and obviously they're not legal because it's not legal here in vegas right and we put one up and get caught within like <laughs> 10 days you know after all the hard work what are they on it so it's like man made it so hard on us luck of the draw man yeah good. luckily we got out of that though it's all good that's funny dude i never planned to keep this house in fact it was just going to be another flip that we did out here in las vegas but something changed i've been looking at my potential tax bill and i've realized i need to start keeping some of these houses as rentals and i went down the list to cherry pick which ones i'd want to keep long term and this one i'm really excited about because it has the potential to be a cash cow <laughs> I purchased this home for a million dollars and the plan was to put a couple hundred thousand into it and then resell it for around one and a half million. But I think it has the potential to make way more as a rental property than it does as a flip. So this house is actually in Henderson, Nevada where Airbnb is legal. I currently don't own any Airbnbs in Las Vegas because it's very restrictive. But Henderson, on the other hand, will allow you to do it as long as you follow all of their rules and guidelines. Now, even if it doesn't get approved for Airbnb, there are still a number of exit strategies that could make it such a great rental. For one, it has a really big guest house, and depending on how we choose to renovate and rent it, it could be a lot of money every single month. But another thing you're starting to see people in Vegas do is just furnish them and rent them out long term. I've seen a lot of people do that recently on normal homes, on bigger homes like this, and they're making a significant amount of money every single month without the headache of having to do Airbnb and bookings every day. But even if we don't go that route, we can still rent this long-term as a normal rental, and we could do it as the main house and the guest house, and it will cash flow far more than the mortgage. And the reason this house is gonna be so desirable no matter how we rent it is because it's in a beautiful part of Henderson that's very remote, it's very quiet, and you get a ton of land out here. One of the weird things about this house is there are sheds literally everywhere. I think there's at least six of them. And some of them, like this one, are really nice. This would actually make for a really good YouTube studio for someone. And that's just one of the features of this backyard. You guys saw that there was a ton of covered patio, which you can do a lot under. But also, as we go down here, you've got this hot tub that we're gonna fix up and make really nice. And you've got this giant yard that could be really anything. As you can see, they've already got these walking paths built in, which are really nice. You could have pets, you could have horses potentially. I don't know what they allow out here. They even had a garden which looks really good. I've never gardened in my life, so I wouldn't know what to do with it, 
but we would make it really nice for whoever wants to stay here. But what makes this house completely different is just the amount of plants and yard and everything. You don't see that too often in Las Vegas. And for me, I know a lot of people who are out east think that this is not greenery, but this is a lot of green for somebody who's in Las Vegas. It doesn't remind me of the desert that I see everywhere else. And then, as I said, you've got all of these sheds, which I don't know why they have so many. I don't know what they were doing. As you can see, the shed's in really good shape. I don't really know what I would use them for as a rental, but if you guys have any ideas, let me know in the comments below. Now, even though that area was really cool, as we get to this side of the backyard, it's like a completely different house. You've got this pool and an entire guest house. And just like on the main house, this guest house has a really nice covered patio. There's a whole bunch of cool stuff you could put here with dining tables or patio furniture. But this is where the real value add of the deal comes. This guest house is 1,250 square feet. Now, as you can see, they were using it as a little workstation. There's not a ton going on here. But this could very easily be a nice two bedroom home that could rent sole and separate from the main house. I'm not sure how exactly we're gonna do it, but I could totally see the kitchen going right here, maybe even having a nice little island. And then in this corner, you could have your nice couch, your TV could be there, or your TV could potentially be in the corner or on this wall. There's a number of things you could do. You've already got a half bath here, so I would most likely try and extend this out to give you a full bathroom because you don't really need this space over here. And once you do that, you then have this little area where you can put a dining table and you've got a full on living room. Now they've already cut it off for the second set of the room. This part is absolutely huge. I would not keep this as a one bedroom by itself. I would definitely cut it, make it two bedrooms, and it's still gonna be really big. One of the bedrooms could be over here, and then you can put your master bedroom on this side with the bathroom right in here. In fact, you could probably put a walk-in closet and a bathroom with how big this is. And the reason that this guest house works by itself is because it has its own entrance. Right here, you've got this gate. We could add parking right here, maybe do some cement or asphalt so that it's not just rock. And then they'd have an entrance to their living room right here. But this house would not be complete unless it had its own shed. You can't have that house having five sheds and this one doesn't have its own, so we got that taken care of. Plus, I don't really know what this is, but at least they have access to this as well. So let's talk numbers and the different routes we can go with this house. I believe we can put about $200,000 into the main house and the guest house to get them to the level I want. And the goal would be to do a burr on it. If we can get a value of one and a half million dollars, we can then refinance and get almost all of our capital out of it. And our mortgage on that would be close to $6,000 a month. Now, if I went the traditional route and I rented this out long-term, I could probably get anywhere from four to $5,000 for this main house, assuming the backyard is all exclusive to them. I would then get about 2,000 a month for the guest house. So the gross rent would be about $7,000 between the two, and my mortgage would be about $6,000. Option two would be to Airbnb it. I've talked to multiple people who have Airbnbs here in Henderson, and they think it's very likely that I could make $2,000 a night between the two. Even if it were only rented for 15 days out of the month, you're talking about making 30,000 a month. Now, of course, that doesn't include the cleaning fees and the property management expense, but it's not hard to see how making 30,000 in revenue is gonna be a ton of cash flow against a $6,000 mortgage. But there is one problem with the Airbnb route. Henderson has a rule that you cannot be within a thousand square feet of another permitted Airbnb. And upon looking at the map, it looks like we're barely on the edge of being next to somebody else. Depending on how they measure, we might be 900 to 950 square feet away. So because of that, Airbnb might not be an option, but it's not gonna prevent me from trying. When I look at the map of other properties, I see that some are closer than 1,000 feet, so I'm gonna try my best to see if we can get it pushed through. But the other option would be trying to buy that other person out of their permit if they don't let me. But there is the last option we talked about, which is just furnishing this and renting it long-term. I can see on the MLS that a similar property got $15,000 a month doing just that. And they didn't have two houses. And in all honesty, I'm kind of thinking about going that route anyway. 
I don't have to worry about getting the permits. I also don't have to worry about managing it on a daily basis. And the fees are gonna be way less because it's a long-term rental. And so if I'm able to get 15,000 for both units and my mortgage is only 6,000, this thing's gonna be an absolute cash cow. I should make back what I would have made on a flip in just one to two years of renting this. But I'm also gonna get all the tax benefits that rental properties give me. So that's why I've decided to keep this house instead of flipping it. It's gonna be a lot of work to renovate it and then furnish it, but I do think that the return is gonna be worth it. One of my investors at Pineda Capital sent me a text and said that they just bought the biggest Airbnb in Las Vegas and he wanted me to come by and check it out. So we're here, we're gonna go see it. I'm gonna give him a little gift too. Good to see you, man. Good to see you too. This place is sick. I love it. I'm excited I, to show I, you. I got you a little gift, man. Appreciate Thank you, you sir. With us, man. I love it. Should I wear it for my video? Oh, there we go. Even better. Let's do it. So, branding. Dude, this is huge. How big is this? This is 8,400 square feet. 8,400 square feet. Yes. This is in Henderson, Nevada, which is really where only Airbnbs are allowed right now. Yes. Right now, you're only allowed to legalize short term rentals in Henderson. Okay. Vegas is coming June, July later this year. Dude, if Vegas legalizes Airbnbs, it's, it's gonna be crazy. The floodgates are gonna be wide open. People are gonna be investing from everywhere. Yeah. So this house, dude, I saw you post on Instagram and it's like all Vegas theme. It's got the craziest like Vegas stuff going on, right? Yes, sir. So yeah. like, what is this? This is an office. We wanted to appeal to everybody when they come to this house. We don't want anyone to have to leave. Yeah. So you have the Vegas theme. You can bring your friends, your family. Yeah. You got office here. We have plenty other cards. amenities to show you. Yeah. You got the what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Of course. This is dope. And look at this wall, man. Like this is so much woodwork to create this wall. Yeah. Actually, it's not very expensive. I mean, I'm sure you've done it in flips. Yeah, I yeah. have a flipping background. So we want to create like this giant wall. Yeah. It creates the space. Yeah. So you got this giant living room, you've got, you know, this kitchen area. We'll check out the kitchen in a sec, but you were telling me earlier, like every room has a theme. Yes. All the bedrooms. We themed every bedroom to one of the Las Vegas casinos. Yeah. Yeah. So we have the Flamingo. Okay. We have the Luxor. We have MGM Grand. And then we have Lady Luck in the master bedroom. Okay. We'll check out Lady Luck, but I'm sure they'll B-roll you some of, uh, those other bedrooms. Yep. So you got this beautiful kitchen over here. Like what was the inspiration for this? So we wanted to make it modern, clean. I wanted it to feel new, yeah. but we also didn't want to spend a ton of money. Right. We didn't want to tear everything out. Those are the existing cabinets. Oh really? Yeah. We they, just took they out. They look new. Uh, <laughs> that's what we're going for. Yeah. So the new modern thing, we took these upper cabinets out. Okay. Put floating shelves in. Looks good. Yeah. And you don't really need that many cups and stuff for an Airbnb. We don't need storage. Yeah. So we didn't we didn't need these upper cabinets. We wanted to make it feel nice, yeah. airy, open. No, it looks good. And I think too, with an Airbnb, they're not gonna rent it because you all of a sudden spent so much more money on these cabinets. Like the fact that these are nice and they look great, it wouldn't have made sense to put- They do in. enough. Yeah. They come for the other amenities. Right. They come for everything in the backyard. We'll show you that in a minute. Yep. The design, the artwork. Let's see the lady look, because I know that, you know, these theme bedrooms are probably one of my favorite things. And as we go through here, like I notice all of the painting everywhere. Like you've got those um, flowers back there, like that wall's got, looks like a little garden. Is that some yeah, snakes that's wall, and different things? Wall up? covering. Yeah. We wanted to give every section of the house kind of a different vibe. Like when you come to sit at the cafe, yeah. you're here at the cafe, we built um, a bench so that everyone could, you know, you're gonna have 16 to 20 people here. Yeah. We wanna be able to entertain everybody. Yeah, no, that's cool, man. Yeah, so this master is sweet, man. You've got the lady luck right there. There she is, Las Vegas themed. You've still, once again, you did the woodwork in the back. Looks really good with the black accent. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Provides, it provides depth, provides a feature wall. Yep. But we didn't have to spend a ton of money. Then as we come over here, you've got this really big makeup area, big closets. And I really like this. What gave you the idea to do this? We just wanted it to be fun. Yeah. You know what I mean? We want people to come in and feel good. 
let them know you look good. If they're, <laughs> if they're getting ready for whatever they're getting ready for or yeah. had a wild night, you look good. You look good. Yeah. Once again, all of it's continued. You've got the showgirl right there. You've got the black accent walls. Yeah. We think the photos are going to sell the property. You know what I mean? Yeah. When 100%. people go on Airbnb and they look through the photos, yeah. that's what makes or breaks the deal. Yeah. Well, I think the coolest part of this house, like you have the main area, which is bedrooms and that nice kitchen, but the downstairs is nuts. The basement. That's yeah. where the magic happens. Yeah, let's go check it out. All right. So you got the basement down Hold here. on, hold on. Hmm. You ever been to a speakeasy? No. You want to see the secret room we got here? Yeah, what do you got? All get? right. The photo booth. <laughs> oh, dude. This is sick. Look, you got the lights all glowing. You got the cards everywhere. Selfie oh, stick. Oh, you got the selfie stick. Dude, oh, and then you got all of the props. Dude, this is sick. What was this before? Bathroom. This was a bathroom. It was a bathroom. How many times in real estate do you ever see anyone take a, or get rid of a bathroom? Never, never, never. But the thought was like, we have to make this place fun. Yeah. You'll see that we didn't do any tile work. We didn't do any artwork for a resale value. Yeah. We did it for, for the guests, for you the know fun. what I mean? You're gonna make the money back with all this fun stuff. So this is where the fun begins. You got this fun bathroom in here. Gotta have an arcade. Yeah. We're in Las Vegas. This is nuts, dude. So what was the inspiration for like making this, you know, the highlighter, blue, just Vegas in general? So we had a couple options here. We were thinking ax throwing. That was our first idea. Oh. And we're like, uh, they're gonna hit the ceilings, dude. Liability. <laughs> and then we were thinking baseball, you know what I mean? Yeah. Put a speed thing here. So when you're throwing. Oh yeah. Those we are just always fun. And then we we landed on arcade because every casino has an arcade. Yeah. So we wanted to really make it feel the neon, the neon lights, the neon glow paint. So a real, what, what was this before? This is such an odd room. This was all storage. It was oh. all cabinets lining every single wall all the way up and down this whole corridor. Wow. Yeah. And for those of you who have noticed, like the light is uh, just automatically turning on. You got motion lights everywhere. Yes. Just because of these long hallways down here. Yeah. We don't want people looking for light switches. Yeah. Hey, I couldn't find it. As soon as you turn the corner, it's already on. Light goes off. Now this is the coolest part right here. Like, you got the golden nugget. You've got the mint. We have this uh, guy. Did you see we we provided signage to? Oh, where, I, would, I wouldn't even have noticed. Where that you want to go? Wow. Arcade, restroom. Wow. You got all the Vegas stuff here. Binions. The Sky Ranch. I've never even heard of the Sky Ranch. I, I haven't either. The artist who did the work was a little bit older than us. So. Okay. Oh, so check this out. This is the gym. Yes, sir. So you got all this storage for your gym equipment. Yep. Towels, yoga mats. Oh, this is nice. You got a row machine. You got a treadmill, bench. Yep. Got the you got bike. You got the Bowflex. Yeah, we had a hard time trying to figure out what to do with this room. Uh huh. We landed on gym, and I think it actually works perfectly. Yeah. What's weird about this house is there's like so many like narrow rooms. Yeah, that's why we had a really, like I said, a hard time figuring out what to do with each room. Yeah. And I think this, like I said, landed perfectly. Yeah, I think the gym is great. Like everything fits perfect. We want to appeal to everybody. I don't know how many people are actually going to use it, but it's cool. <laughs> I, I might. All the people are partying in Vegas. We'll see if they actually wake up and put it hit the work. gym. I know you would. This is this is true. Yeah, the wealthy way. That's right. I gotta hit my wealthy sixty. There you so, go. Oh, this is cool. You thought of the kids. Yes, we wanted to appeal to everybody. Yeah. So if people are looking at the photos and they say, you know what, we have six kids that want to come. What yeah. are they gonna do? Right. And they got this cool playroom. The the artwork's a little like kid more. We kid. kept we kept the Vegas theme. Right. But we just went kids Vegas theme. Yeah. No, that's super cool. All right. The games. Oh, dude. All right. Before I even talk about the games, I got to give a shout out to whoever painted this house. 100%. Like this, this is crazy. What did it cost you to just paint the house? My original budget for paint was 2000 bucks. We did some this line art. 2000 bucks. We did some line <laughs> art here and there. And then I saw the artist's capabilities. Yeah. And she showed me what she could do. We ended up spending 7,500 bucks on all the artwork, which you, you got a steal, which was a steal. That shouldn't have been 7,500 bucks I, for everything I've seen. I totally agree. Man, that's cool. So obviously we're in Vegas and have a card table. Yep. That's easy. 
You've got the bar. You got huge uh, Jenga. Yahtzee. Connect four. Yeah. I love this game. Shuffleboard. It's tough. It takes skill. Dude, all right. We'll play one round right here. One Whoever puck. gets the highest uh, score. Score. But you've, you've got home field advantage. You got to go first. I've never thrown a puck on this table. All right. Come on. Zero. All right. Wow. I just can't go off. It's coming. It's coming. It's all the way. Wow. All right. One, one more, more, one more. All right. Run it back. Stop. Uh, it looks like we got to level. We got to level this thing, huh? Yeah, we do have to level it. Yeah, it's the level. Okay. That's why we suck. No winners. We're going we to win. We're going to level that later. We're not going to the casinos. Yeah. You have the pool table. This is great. Yep. I also noticed you got these benches like everywhere. Was that just, this is just built in with the house, huh? These were all built and we didn't want to tear into them because yeah. I'm guessing there's mechanical, electrical, or potential plumbing yeah. in some of these benches, which is why I think they were built. Well, and they're fine. Like, oh yeah, I, I love it. I think it. it's cool. I you, noticed you, it in the gym. They're everywhere here. You can sit down and talk wherever you're at in the house. Yeah. So, man, this basement's cool, but there's like so much more outside too, right? Yes, there's a two bedroom casita and then all the backyard. All right, man. So how big is this lot? So the lot is 0.93. It's almost a full acre. Yeah, it's big, which is rare in Vegas. And um, it's all developed. Oh, this was already like this way. Yeah, wow. the, the entire lot was developed. There's a sand volleyball court. Yeah. There's a basketball court. We have a kid's playground. Yep, the pool, playground obviously. looks good over there. So you got the nice pool over here. That looks good. Was it already like that? Yeah, pool was just like that. When yeah. we first bought the property, we knew the potential that it had. Right. Two bedroom casita, the pool was done, it was in good shape, pool equipment was done. Yeah. Volleyball so saved, court was you there. You saved a lot of money there. Yep. You've got this basketball court. Pickleball. The volleyball court is huge. It's regulation sand volleyball court. And then we've got this casita. The two bedroom casita. Let's see it. This is where you put the in-laws. Oh, this is a nice casita, man. Yeah. I like how it's set up. Two bedroom casita, Jack and Jill bath. Yeah. You did the woodwork again. Yep. Trying to stay consistent, keep yeah. everything flowing nicely. So were these cabinets already here like the other house? Yes, the existing cabinets, we just repainted them. Right. We did new countertops, we did backsplash. That's it. Yeah. I mean, it looks great. Yeah. Then the bedrooms, did you, okay. There's no Vegas theme in this one. This one's a little more tame. Yep, this is kind of the desert theme you'll see in the other bedroom. Yeah. Yep, we have a full bath here. Okay. Another affirmation on the floor. Oh, get naked. All right. <laughs> I like that one, man. I, in the shower, I would hope you're naked. So <laughs> that makes sense. And we have some more line art. The line art from the artist, I mean, she just killed it. Oh, wow. Yeah, dude, there's line art everywhere. I like this tile. Like you've done this everywhere. You were putting cool little sayings, but You've continued it across a lot of the bathroom. Yeah, it's, it's, cool. it's fun. You yeah. can do almost anything you want because you can cut out all these mosaic pieces. Yeah. Put whatever design you want anywhere. Most people use this as like the floor on showers. Yep. It's cool to see it on a wall. Yeah. And then you got the second bedroom. Oh, okay. You, you do have the desert theme. Some color, some artwork. It's interesting because you can kind of see the desert on this side. It's kind of cool. Yeah. It's like it blends in. Yeah. All right, bro, so I always got to know the numbers of these deals. Of man. course. I, I got to know. So tell me, what'd you buy this house for? We bought it at 1.4. 1.4, what'd you put in to do all this? We put out about 280,000 in the entire renovation. Does that include furniture and stuff? That includes entire, that's everything. Wow. That's furniture, that's paint, that's, that's floors. That's not that much for a house this big. I agree, 100%. We were very budget friendly. Yeah, so, okay, you're into it for about 1.7-ish. Um, what's this thing gonna rent for on Airbnb? So we're going for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Obviously those days rent for less. Right. We're looking for 12 to 1500 bucks a night. Okay. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, anywhere from 18 to $2,200 a night. Right. And then on big weekends, I mean, we're 3,000, 3,500 bucks. Easily. Easy. So have you run any, you know, I'm sure you have performers of what you think it's going to get for the year. Yeah. I mean, based on those numbers, we're going to do, we're going to gross about a half a million bucks. Half a mil, okay. And what do you think the expenses will be on this? So on most of our short-term rentals, we shoot around 65%. Uh -huh. So we're gonna net probably quarter mil. Quarter mil owning this, plus you get all the tax benefits and all the 
appreciation and everything that's gonna happen. That's just a cool house. I love it, yeah, yeah. So like, what's the plan? Like, once you do this, are you gonna do another one? Oh yeah, yeah, we have two in Vegas right now. Okay. So I think that this is gonna be my retirement. We're gonna keep going. We're just gonna keep buying more short-term rentals okay. until uh, we make enough money and we don't have to do it anymore. Nice, dude. Well, yeah. uh, if people wanna get involved with you, dude, uh, we'll definitely link to your social down cool. below. So, uh, you know, if they wanna book this place. Let's do it. They wanna, you know, partner up with you on doing one of these, man, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. You're, I think you're gonna do a lot more of these, like, this is a lot, dude. Yeah, it was a lot of work. Yeah. I mean, I got to shout out my partner, Jason Griggs, yep. and Brittany, the designer. Yeah. They killed it. Yep. Um, we want to do more. Bring us the deals. Well, bro, it was good. Appreciate yep. you showing me this, Thank you, man. sir. Yeah. Enjoy talking to you. Yeah. Kill it. No, that's super cool. Like, I just love seeing that there's these different ways to kind of invest in real estate, man, because so many people have this stigma that, yeah, if you don't get a 30-year conventional, like, it's a bad loan, or... You know, if I don't have the right debt debt to income, or if I have bad credit, I'll never be able to buy a rental property. And you guys are like, no, dude, like, we're not really worried about that. We're just really worried about the deal. Yeah, because at the end of the day, who makes the payments, right? It, a lot of times it's the tenants that make the payments, not the actual person that owns the house, right? So that's kind of the idea behind even DSCR loans is um, the owner isn't, they're not technically making the monthly mortgage payments, it'll be the tenants that are actually paying rent to the landlord to make the mortgage payments. So, you know, it works a lot better that way, I think, personally, qualifying wise. How many of your loans are you guys doing do you see that are like people wanting to do Airbnb? Ooh, a lot more recently a lot and more a lot recently. more recently. And I think there are a lot, the big reason of that is because um, a lot of clients now, I'm sure you've seen the Airbnb market is kind of getting tightened up by the government, I think with the government and the mm -hmm. counties. And, you know, now they're issuing out permits for you to be able to do it. You know, if you don't have the permit, you can't have an Airbnb and whatnot. So, you know, I had a um, recently had a client in even Encinitas in San Diego. And um, he we kind of did this. It was a under 30 day purchase. He was buying it as a short term rental because appar apparently they were going to issue out those permits. Right. So we had to close that thing in like, you know, 25 days. Um, but it was a three point two million dollar house right. that he was going to you know kind of rent up and make it a short term rental. Um, and it was just a it was just a rush, you know, and all we're getting a lot more clients now, especially I mean, like we had a couple of clients in Tennessee. Who yeah, that's that a, that's very, cool. very big on. And they're like buying out, they're basically having to buy out like LLCs that own these properties <laughs> instead of buying the actual properties themselves because they the LLC own the permit. Correct. And, exactly. and they can't transfer. It's not, it's not transferable. It's difficult. So it's like, you know, these rules are starting to make it harder and harder. And people, I think, are starting to notice that. And so they're flooding into these short term real estate investment markets for them to be able to kind of build their portfolio because they're seeing lucrative. It's, it's very lucrative right? Over yeah. the long term, even the short term. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. So Vegas is about to like change their rules because right now pretty much in like Las Vegas, the city is basically banned period. Wow. Um, can't do it at all? No. Wow. Do you, is, can you get a permit though? No. Really? Not in Las Vegas. But Henderson has allowed it. So Henderson said, hey, we're going to do it. We got these rules, but their rules are really stupid. Um, one of the rules is like you can't be within a thousand feet of another one. <laughs> yep. No so, way. <laughs> like I bought this really big house that is one and a half million dollars. Um, it's a house and a guest house. It would have been a sick Airbnb, and um, it's nine hundred feet away from the next one. And, and they like, couldn't do it. Yeah, they're like, no, you can't do it. And I'm just like, okay. But in turn, what's funny is that house ended up being what I'm now going to give to my NFT holders. Mm. Um, Sweet. And I'm doing it in a way to try and circumvent their rules because it's not technically, you know, a short-term rental. Like, these guys have ownership. Yeah. And so, like, it'll be interesting to see how they interpret it. Like, I'm planning to, like, have a <laughs> fight <laughs> with the, the city, and that's fine. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, to go back to the point of these rules, like, they suck. You know, it's yeah. like, Dude, I'm 900 feet away from this guy. Yeah. yeah. And so pretty much Henderson is, I don't want to say illegal, but for the most part it is because you can't get a permit anymore. There's yeah. none left. So like, none. what do you do? You have to do what you're talking about where, you know, you would buy somebody else's LLC to do it. Yeah. 
That's stupid. I know. It's, it, it makes it nearly impossible because most people, they'll sell, like the deal we were doing in Nashville, the, the guy ended up paying more for the LLC than he did for the property. Wow. Yeah. Because it, he just found it Because it owned that like valuable. six properties, that oh. same LLC. And, and so you had to buy like, the whole portfolio. Yep. Yeah. Dang, that's crazy. Yeah, dude. The, the more regulation there is, the more just dumb stuff you see. So when the pandemic hit, many people were asking what's gonna happen to Airbnb? Is the company itself gonna go bankrupt? Are people even gonna want a vacation? What's the deal? Now look, I can only speak for my own, but in my Airbnb business, which is in Big Bear, California, it has been crazy. People are paying more and they're booking it more often than ever before. And to me, it makes sense. Big Bear is a place where there's nature, where people wanna just get away from the city. You kinda got space. It's like the perfect place to social distance. Go get some fresh air, hike the trails, maybe go to the lake. And once the snow drops, go hit the slopes. I started investing in Big Bear over three years ago because I felt like it was undervalued and I felt like it was recession proof. And three years later, my predictions are both looking correct. The values have skyrocketed the last three years. It obviously is doing great in a recession or a pandemic or whatever you want to call it. So I'm going to show you guys what we did in October and I'm going to tell you what we plan for in December, assuming they don't shut down. So before we start, I have eight units that we Airbnb and I have two more under construction. I own all of these homes. I know there are a lot of people that teach Airbnb sublease. I'm not a fan of it because that doesn't build wealth. It's more so just cash flow. I wanna own the properties and get all the tax benefits, the appreciation, the principal pay down. That's where the real wealth is generated. But what I'm about to show you is the cash flow wealth, which is also really good. Another thing I should mention is I don't do anything. If you haven't realized by now, I don't like to do much in any of my businesses. I'm all about hiring great people, paying them fairly, and keeping them on board for the long haul. And my Airbnb business is no different. So my property manager who I hired here in Las Vegas manages them all remotely. And so she's created this really cool spreadsheet for me that I'm about to show you now. All right, so first thing we're gonna look at is the income summary. So as you can see, I've got eight properties on here. And we'll just go over it line by line so you can see. Pineda's Peak is a two bedroom, one bathroom home. It was actually the very first one that I bought. And that one made almost $6,000 in October. Three years ago, I paid $200,000 for that home, put about 35,000 into it. Today, it's probably worth about 330. The next two are Pines One and Pines Two. So this is a house and a guest house. And so this one was probably my most lucrative purchase because it gets double rent. So I bought this house a couple months after buying Peak. I saw the early returns on Peak and I was like, I gotta buy more up here. This is crazy. And so I got really lucky on this deal. It was a home that was in foreclosure and I got it for 230,000 and ended up putting about 60,000 into it. So I'm all in it for 290 and it recently appraised on a Burr refinance that I did for $450,000. And that one did over $8,000 in October between the two. Next one up is Grizzly Grounds. And this one I did not plan to keep. I actually bought this as a flip and I ended up having to keep it because I didn't get what I wanted. And I'm actually really grateful that I kept it because it's an awesome property that does super good. I bought this for $170,000 and put 30,000 into it. So I'm all into this one for $200,000. And when I got it appraised on the Burr, they appraised it around like $300,000. It was crazy. So another great deal. Next one up is Bear Mountain and this one is really cool because it's like three houses down from the slopes. You can literally take your snowboard, walk onto the slope and go straight down. It's super cool and this one rents really well during the winters because snowboarders and skiers love it. So I bought this one about two years ago for $225,000. We put a little over $30,000 into it and it appraised for $330,000. Another great investment that gets great cash flow and gained me a lot of equity and net worth. Next one up is my personal favorite, which is Ryan's Retreat. And this is our biggest one. All the other ones I just told you about, this one's actually 1,600 square feet, four bedroom, three bathroom. And as you can see, it gets the most. It got $8,400 in October. In fact, this one's already been booked for Christmas. Christmas for $1,000 a night. Super crazy. Like I said, the demand in Big Bear has been insane. But I bought this property for $270,000 and I put $50,000 into it. So I'm all in it for $320,000 and it also appraised for $450,000. So the Burr strategy once again worked. If you haven't realized, I Burr all my properties. I truly believe in the strategy. It is one of the best real estate strategies out there. And honestly, the only problem with this house is that it's booked too much. We really can't even use it when we want to because it's booked. We have to book it months in advance to make sure we get it. So my wife isn't too happy about that, but 
it's on her to book it, right? Whenever we try and go last minute, it's always booked. There's nothing we can do about it. So let's go to the next two. The first six that I just showed you, I've had for over a couple of years, but these last two have recently hit the market. We finished renovating them this year and getting them furnished. So Fawn Skin Farm is a very small property. It's not even 600 square feet, but it's a two bedroom, one bathroom home. And it's actually outside of Big Bear. And originally I bought this home to flip it because I got it for $75,000, but rehab was crazy. It ended up being a $90,000 rehab. And I was gonna flip it for $220,000, but I just realized that it's better to keep it. I'd already renovated so much with it that I might as well just keep it, take all the tax deductions, furnish it, and get the cash flow. And as you can see, it's already made $4,000. Now remember, this is a very tiny home. I'm into it for around $160,000. So the mortgage is not much, and it's gonna continue to make more as we get more reviews. So I'm glad we kept it. The last one is this Quonset hut. And what's funny about this Quonset hut is I posted about it on TikTok and people were roasting me on TikTok. They were saying, that thing's a piece of crap. There's no way you'll make 5,000 a month. And I just put in the video, I'm like, trust me guys, this is gonna average 5,000 a month, and there's gonna be months where it makes way more. And as you can see in October, we're already at $6,000 a month. And that's with no reviews, not even in the winter yet. It's crazy. So all you TikTok haters, I'd love to tell you something, but then I'll get demonetized, so I'm not gonna say it, but just let the numbers speak for themselves. But anyways, overall, as you can see, the gross revenue for all eight properties was $44,000 in October. So let's go over the expenses now. Now, starting at the top, as you can see, my mortgages are about $9,500. One thing to mention with that is that it does not include Fonskin Farm or the Quonset Hut. Currently, I have private money on those where I don't pay any monthly payments, and I'm in the process of refinancing them both. As I've always said, whenever I get funding, I don't pay any payments. I do 100% leverage, no payments or anything. That's how I flip houses and I buy rentals the same way. And so once I refinance these, the mortgage will probably go up three to 4,000, I would say. It's really gonna depend what they appraise the value at and how much leverage they're gonna give me. Next up, you have the utilities. Water is 450 bucks, electricity is 1100 bucks, and gas is only $169. So not a ton of money on electricity, but one thing to say is that is always fluctuating depending on the season. After that, we've got our internet, which is about $400. And then the next biggest expense, which is the cleaners. We pay $8,900 to the cleaners on all these properties. After that, you've got maintenance for $245 and supplies for $300. This is one that also varies depending on the season. Maintenance is much higher during the winter because we need to get someone to shovel snow out of the driveway. Supplies can be really high one month if we buy something in bulk. So once we get low on toilet paper and shampoo and dish soap and all that stuff, we'll just buy a ton of it on Amazon and spend a couple thousand dollars. A big order like that would also include bed sheets, blankets, pillows, and those types of things have to be replaced at least every year. Next up, you've got the spa fee, which is about $1,000. When I first started out, I wanted to put spas in every property, and then I realized that they didn't really give me that much more rent. We still rented them out like crazy without spas, and we didn't have all the headaches of owning a spa. So personally, I don't put them in properties anymore. And then lastly, you have this property management fee of about $3,500 that goes directly to my property manager. And that fee is simply 10% of gross revenue minus cleaning fees. So if you remember, the gross revenue was about $44,000 and the cleaning fees were about $9,000. So it comes out to about $35,000, which she is getting 10% of. And she's worth every penny. She deals with the tenants, she deals with the cleaners, she deals with the bookings, everything you can imagine. All in all, the expenses come out to almost $26,000. Now, an expense I didn't mention here is the transient tax. That's basically the short-term Airbnb tax that cities put on you. Almost every city has this if they allow Airbnb. Now, I didn't include it here because we pay that quarterly, so I didn't pay it as part of this month, but also it varies from city to city. These properties are in different cities and counties, so the tax rate is different on all of them. But if I had to guess, it'll probably be around three to $4,000 this month. So anyways, let's go to the moment y'all been waiting for and look at the cash flow. Once you take the gross income minus the total expenses, it comes out to about $19,000 in cash flow. Now granted, that still doesn't really paint the picture. We're gonna have to pay a higher mortgage once we refinance, and we're gonna have to pay those taxes. So when you add that in, it probably would be around $12,000 in cash flow in October. Still really good. We're making over $1,000 per property in cash flow per month. There ain't many rentals that can do that. And that's totally hands off. I don't do anything. 
The cash flow would be higher if I was managing them myself. But obviously I don't do that. I'm all about building out the team, not really doing too much anymore once I've built it out. And look, even though October was a really good month, the winter's where we make a lot of money. I actually think we might hit $100,000 in December. If we hit that goal, we're gonna be making a lot of money that month. Now, a lot of people ask me about Airbnb because I have quite a few of them. I live in Las Vegas, Nevada, but I have Airbnbs in Big Bear, California. And I love Big Bear because I love vacationing up there. It's a beautiful little city. We snowboard, we can go on the lake, we can hike. It's so different than Las Vegas and I love it. And on top of that, they've been amazing investments for me. I currently have six different properties that we have rented out. They make amazing cash flows. My friends use them, my family uses them, we use them. They've been awesome investments. We also have four other properties up there that are under construction that we're gonna add to the portfolio. So I've got quite a bit of experience with Airbnb. And unlike a lot of the Airbnb gurus you see, I actually own them all. You see, most people who teach Airbnb actually don't own them. All they're doing is leasing a property, furnishing it, and then airbnb -ing it. And that is an easy way to get started if you don't have a lot of money, but it doesn't lead to long-term wealth. See, when you sublease a property, you don't own it. And so all you're really doing is creating a job for yourself. You're creating monthly cash flow, which is great, but there's a lot of different ways you could do that as well. You don't have to do it through Airbnb. But when you can create cash flow and gain the long-term wealth and appreciation that comes with owning real estate, well, then it becomes a really good thing. So I would say if you're looking at Airbnb, I'm not a big fan of doing the sublease and what these guys teach, but if you can own real estate and you can cash flow and it's in a great area that you like to vacation in, Airbnb is great. Now, we've had this pandemic and there's a lot of people who are struggling with Airbnb. Many cities have stopped allowing Airbnb and have stopped tourism in general. And so Airbnb owners were figuring out what to do, how to scramble through that situation. So I just wanted to give you my perspective as a business owner on what I did to get through. So in Big Bear, California, where I have my Airbnbs at, they banned it. And I had a choice to make. I had to figure out what I was going to do to get through it. All of those properties I have are leveraged, meaning they have mortgages. Now look, in my situation, I did have a lot of cash reserves. I could withstand it, no issue, even if I wasn't getting rent. But I always wanna be prepared for worst case scenario. And like many people, I decided I wanted to do mortgage forbearance. And for those of you who don't know, basically mortgage forbearance is delaying your payments. It's not like they're forgiven. You will have to pay them back at some point. You can delay them and not make them since you don't have any rent coming in or you have some type of income loss. In my case, the income loss was not being able to use them and Airbnb them. So I applied for mortgage forbearance. After about a month, I saw a Meet Kevin video where he had talked about many people were doing mortgage forbearance and actually getting their credit dinged. The banks were still marking it on their credit that they were in forbearance, even though they weren't supposed to. So I said, you know what? I don't need the cash that bad, so I might as well just pay them all, not deal with messing up my credit over trying to save a few bucks. So I stopped it paid my payments and have been making them ever since. So Kevin, if you're watching this video, I appreciate you for putting your video out because I was one of the guys telling people, take mortgage forbearance. There's nothing wrong with it. They can't hurt you. And of course the banks ended up hurting people. They ended up dinging their credit and doing all these things. So it is what it is. Never trust the banks. So I had to figure out what do I want to do now that I can't Airbnb them? My initial thought was this is probably only going to last for two months, maybe three months max. So in the worst case scenario, I do absolutely nothing and I pretty much eat it on those months. I'll say that it actually did happen at the perfect time. Big Bear, like many Airbnb markets, is very seasonal. The winters are huge. We make at least 50% of our revenue just in the winter because everyone wants to go there, snowboard, play in the snow. It's a log cabin type feel. It's amazing. So if this would have happened in the winter, we would have been in trouble. The fact that it happened in March, April, May was great. That's actually the slowest time of the year in Big Bear. So that was okay for me. If it was gonna happen at any point, this was the best time. I would have been really upset if we weren't able to do it in the winter. And who knows, if they lock us down again during the winter because they think something's gonna happen, then I'll have to figure out a new strategy. But I'm not planning for that. Anyways, what I ended up doing was I reached out to a couple of my realtor friends up there and I said, do you know anyone that wants to rent on a monthly basis? They had rental restrictions for Airbnb, but if you wanted to rent to somebody for over a month, there was no restriction against that. And after reaching out to a few people, luckily my realtor came to me and said, I actually know this guy who has a company that needs to rent for a month. And he actually needs two homes. Apparently his company is helping build this roller coaster type deal in Big Bear. It worked out great for him because in Big Bear, there's such a shortage of rental housing. Everyone likes to put their properties on Airbnb because it pays so well. So there's pretty much no regular rental inventory. There's also not very many hotels in Big Bear. It's a small town. And so I don't know how he would have done it without us, but it ended up benefiting both of us. I rented my two biggest units to him 
them for two months, just at a fixed price. It was less than what I would have made on Airbnb if things were normal. As far as numbers go, I rented it to him for $3,000 a month. On normal Airbnb, I would have probably made 4,000 to 5,000 a month on those houses. But I also have cleaning fees, I have other things with that. So in reality, I probably didn't lose anything on those two houses. And the fact that he wanted to rent for two months was amazing because that's what we're anticipating the lockdown to be for. So I rented those two out for two months and then I had my other four. Now, unfortunately, I could not find anyone for my other four, so I ended up having to just bite the bullet on those ones. I paid the mortgages without getting any rent and it kind of just is what it is. That's what happens with rentals, guys. Whether it's an Airbnb or a long-term rental, you're gonna have vacancy. And you don't plan for vacancy like that with Airbnb. You don't plan on a whole city being shut down, but that's why it's always important to have reserves for any type of rental you have. Doesn't matter if it's long-term or short-term. So in the market that I'm in in Big Bear, it eventually opened back up after two months. And once it opened up, let me tell you, it was crazy. Things were renting like gangbusters. We were getting booking, 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 and it was nuts. I've had plenty of friends from Vegas wanting to go up there and I can't even give them a cabin because we're fully booked. It was like immediate once we were able to open back up. People were so pent up, ready to get out of their home that they wanted to go somewhere in the woods. They wanted to just get away from everything. With all the drama in the world, with all the restrictions, to get out in nature was what they wanted to do. And Big Bear's the perfect place for almost anyone in Southern California, Vegas, or Arizona. And that was one of the big reasons I invested in Big Bear because I felt like it was kind of a recession-proof market. My opinion is, if there's a recession, people stop doing expensive things. They stop going on the expensive vacations like going to Europe, going to Disneyland. Oh my gosh, it's so expensive to go there. But people don't stop vacationing when there's a recession. They will still do it, but they'll opt for something cheaper like Big Bear. You know why Big Bear's so great? You can go hike for free. You can go play in the snow for free. You can go experience nature for free. You can go to the lake for free. Going to Big Bear for a vacation costs significantly less and you will get an amazing experience. So that's why I felt like it's a recession-proof investment. As long as I'm able to actually Airbnb them, which wasn't the case these last two months, but still, in the long run, that investment has paid me so well. And even with this little hiccup, it's still gonna be an amazing investment. So to summarize, as an Airbnb owner, yes, these last couple of months sucked. I had to get resourceful. I had to figure out how we could salvage these months. I had to figure out, is this something I wanna do going forward, long term? If there's a second wave of this, how do I prepare better for it? But I gotta say, with the unexpected, we ended up doing pretty well. And that's because we had good cash reserves and we got resourceful. I know that there are plenty of owners who have not experienced what I've experienced. They didn't have reserve. Maybe they were in their good season and losing this income in April and May was very, very tough. I know there are many owners of Airbnbs that want to sell because of this. They don't wanna deal with this ever again. And that's okay. Just like there are landlords who don't wanna own long-term rentals, there are people who would kill to have those rentals. It all just depends on your perspective. But one thing I do know is whether you have long-term or short-term rentals, there's always risk. You gotta always have reserves. But if you're able to keep those properties and cash flow, you will win in the long run. Remember that, owning real estate always wins. Thanks for making us to the end. The good news is I've got another one that I know you're gonna like, and all you gotta do is click it right here. Linking it right here. All you gotta do is just click it, and you're gonna see this new episode that you're gonna love.